We're going to call to order. We're going to call to order the work session for the Board of Commissioners at 107 on July 2nd, uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, we're here to discuss a uh, our transportation office finances, and this is related to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the reduction in in uh, 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 drives or uh, trips that we've seen. Uh, also in our um, business fleet as well, some reductions there. So we wanted to have a conversation related to this, um, offsetting some of those costs. So uh, in terms of who was going to be presenting, Margaret, if you wanted to uh, uh, kick it off and give the floor to anybody else who needs it. Uh, uh, so let's see. I think uh, everyone's here. I can see everyone. I think it might be uh, best to set some, uh, Tom would set some context for the discussion and then certainly uh, Ryan and Dave and Natalie can add in. Um, but this is a follow-up to a previous discussion and I think Tom should kick it off. Yep, I agree. Um... So just for some context, um, again, in our last informational uh, session, work session, um, we recapped where we landed as a county as a whole for 2019. And um, as a whole, our unassigned fund balance um, right now, preliminary for 2019, increased by about $565,000 from $9.3 million to $9.9 .9 million. Um, as Margaret had talked about before, um, we're in the process of finalizing the uh, CAF or the Co Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the county. And this will be submitted by the controller's office uh, through our auditors, Baker Tilly, by the end of July. So there's still time to make adjustments. If we will want to transfer uh, funds within the 2019 year, we can, we can do that. And initially in the um, 2019 budget in 2019 actual, there was transfers of funds from the general fund over to the transportation fund of over $100,000, which was part of the budget. Um, as we all know, there was a shared ride rate increase in um, August of 2019, which uh, greatly increased the amount that we received in revenue. And we saw that in the last several months, and it really closed the gap as far as um, how transportation performed for the year. And for the year, um, they, they did quite well um, for year ending 2019. But obviously, as we got into 2020 here and uh, with the COVID-19 heading in March of uh, 2020, when we initially did their budget uh, back in late fall, winter of 2019, there was no um, transfer from the general fund to transportation because the shared ride rate was going to be in effect for the whole year. For 2020 and based on that and where our ridership was at that point we would have had enough revenues to offset the expenditures um, obviously with everything that happened in March and April and then in May uh, ridership was down dramatically and so um, my recommendation was to move some funds and I had uh, uh, recommended about three hundred thousand dollars being moved over from that surplus over the transportation fund uh, knowing that we were going to have a shortfall in revenues for, for this year. Um, during that discussion, uh, we discussed getting some more information, more detail to kind of back up the thought process be behind the 300000 I reached out to Ryan. Ryan sent me a detailed email then with some backup um, financial information. But basically, right now, um, through the end of May, um, the transportation department, which is made up of the paratransit and the fleet, was showing a deficit of around $266,000. Uh, Ryan, based on rough estimates of even increasing throughout the year, because of the social distancing guidelines, it's going to be pretty much impossible for them to be at the 100% of where they would be. So he ran scenarios where we would get, uh, you know, capping the ridership at 75% of their typical pre-pandemic levels. In doing that, it was showing another about $330,000 in, in um, deficit from June to December. So that 330 plus the 266 would be a annual projected loss of $596,000. Now, when we break it down, obviously the um, the revenue would be down by about 971,000 for the whole year, but there was also going to be savings and expenditures of almost 375,000, 200 of that uh, coming on the paratransit side and 175,000 on the fleet. 
Um, right now, Dave currently has four um, drivers furloughed, and, and they're close to full-time hour drivers. And then there's one um, office position. That $596,000 loss would um, include having those positions furloughed for the remainder of the year. Um, and the elimination of the um, newly hired office position, that would be a $596,000 loss. Now, um, Ryan also detailed in the email that um, there are um, additional revenues that they're looking at uh, trying to capture. So in May, a budget was submitted for fiscal year 20, 2021 from MATP, which included the reimbursement of fixed costs such as rental and utilities. Um, so those funds could come in and help offset that. But um, again, the 300 grand may not even um, offset all of the um, deficit that they're going to have. And again, it's just based on projections at this point. So um, I just, um, again, I just want to kind of turn it over to, to Ryan or Dave if they want to kind of add some context to that. But um, again, I think it kind of, again, the information that um, Ryan sent to me kind of backed up the thought process, and I just thought we would get ahead of this instead of getting into 20 and getting at the end of the year and having to make a large transfer over at the end of the year, we could kind of get ahead of it and kind of set them up. They would still have that deficit in 20, but they would have the fund balance to absorb it. That was kind of the thought process. Ryan, you go ahead and follow Tom there if you would. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think, as Tom mentioned, uh, forecasting in this and uh, the current state of affairs is, um, is is difficult because we don't know how things are going to progress over the next few months. Uh, for the month of June, we just got data from from June, which was up significantly over um, over May. So we're actually progressing well, but there's still a number of factors that exist to determine whether we will reach that roughly 75% capacity of where we were pre-pandemic. Um, some of those items are, will senior centers uh, reopen? And if so, how many seniors will, will return? Um, our ID clients, which is a, which are, are, are big revenue drivers in, in transportation, are also not, um, uh, not being transported because their service centers are not open like skills. Um, uh, so we, you know, again, are projecting these these numbers as of today. Things can change change tomorrow, um, as we know. Um, but also, uh, as as Tom touched on, um, there are a number of balls in the air where we could potentially procure additional revenue. Um, as mentioned, uh, the rent and utilities uh, per the MATP budget, which I believe we have good guidance from the state that that is allowable, um, but assuming they approve that, which again, we, we, we hope and think that they will, um, that will be another $20,000 a month beginning in July. And again, that because that isn't certain at this point and we don't have approval at this point, that's not included in the, in the projections. Um, but right there, if that is, is approved, that would result in, um, you know, not only the, the second half of, of 20, but going forward, about another twenty thousand dollars in um, in reimbursable revenue um, based on based on the costs incurred on those those fixed items. Um, there's a few other areas out there that I think Dave has, has also explored. Um, I know with MATP potentially requesting a, a rate adjustment, um, the potential for them to allow us to keep the entire budgeted allocation for the year. The way MATP works is we submit a budget, they provide us the money in advance, and then we um, we reflect what we actually uh, can be reimbursed for, um, uh, you know, on our income statement on a monthly basis. But at the end of the year, we are reconciled back to that amount. Um, so uh, there's possibilities, again, as we put in the, the information that we, that we sent over that, uh, they could allow for, due to the pandemic, uh, you know, a bridge payment to allow us to keep that, keep the entire allocation for 1920. And if that occurs, um, that would greatly minimi minimize, if not completely eliminate the uh, the shortfall. Again, depending on where, where trips go in, in the future. And, and Dave has also had some conversations with PennDOT as to the ability of, of them potentially providing a temporary lifeline or support 
uh, due to the pandemic. You want me to talk, Margaret? This remote thing's making me crazy today. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> okay. All right, so to follow up on uh, Tom and Ryan, uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, when we hit January, we hit the ground running and running hard, but then obviously things changed. As he said, June has come in much better. Uh, I just received my contractor out of county transporters uh, invoice for the month of June, and he's up almost 50% uh, from what he was in May. He's he's up uh, to uh, 13,300 worth of trips in the month of June as compared to 7,700 in May. So, you know, things are definitely coming back. Uh, the, the requests are there, the, requ the needs are there. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, the MA, uh, this year we were able to budget in uh, rental and, and, and other costs that, that we didn't previously. Uh, when they changed the structure uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, that gave us this opportunity. So, you know, if that does come through, our MA budget is worth nearly just under a million dollars total, including those uh, fixed costs that we're going to bill for if they approve. They've not given us any indication that they wouldn't, uh, not questioned them. They had a couple questions initially. We gave them back the answers, and they're just in the process now of final approving everything. But, uh, you know, I anticipate to have that soon. Uh, hopefully they will give us uh, everything we've asked for, or the most of it. Uh, that will help immensely. PennDOT has, has told all of us uh, statewide, uh, the shared ride providers, that they're working on a way to give us some subsidy. They've not guaranteed anything, but, uh, you know, fixed route obviously falls under federal guidelines, so they were able to get CARES Act money. But we don't fall directly under that, therefore they have to, uh, they have to give us subsidies and, and uh, monies like that in a different manner, and they're working on that. They have, have made it known that they are working on something for the shared ride providers to help us. I can go back many years back when we had uh, bad winters and, and lost several days of service. Uh, at the end of that process, they did subsidize us. They, they would give us subsidies for those uh, lost days. So I feel confident we're gonna get something from them. I couldn't even begin to guess how much, but anything we get certainly a bonus. Uh, our trips are coming up. I did get word today, senior centers are reopening uh, July 13th. Uh, they have some things in mind they wanna do. We're, we're doing it uh, with limited capacity on the vans, but uh, they all seem to, to wanna get back to something. Uh, so those are trips we haven't had for three months. Therefore, uh, you know, every trip we get from there is obviously gonna increase our numbers. Uh, I, I I am hopefully we don't go back to a yellow or a red phase. Uh, if we do, then you know we're we're all going to sit here and wonder what we do next. But a, a, as was mentioned, uh, a, at this point and for the unforeseeable future, I do not see a need to bring back another office person. Uh, we're, we're handling things with the current staff uh, and, and adequately handling that. The, the, four, the, the furloughed drivers, uh, you know, there's no question that right now I don't need them. Uh, even with vacations and, and drivers taking time off, uh, we're still okay. Uh, I'm not running short, so. We just keep uh, taking trips. We don't deny anybody. We take them. We're, we're doing as many trips as we can ourselves. We're not contracting out some trips that we would have previously when we were extremely busy. So, you know, we're doing that to keep our people busy, and keep our, our staff working. And, and, and even still, the numbers are coming back in that respect. So uh, as the facilities are seeing clients, uh, in counseling and, and different things that we take these people to, it, it only enhances what we do every day. So 
Uh, Natalie, I guess uh, you want to follow up? Um, I mean, I can just speak for some of the other human service departments in terms of what we're doing. So Dave mentioned that senior centers, you know, hopefully uh, they're looking at that potential week of July 13th to start opening back up. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, in terms of need and, and people's comfort level and community safety. Um, uh, intellectual disability programs, I think we're hopeful to open in July. I think there are some concerns, you know, as we kind of enter into some of those, you know, uh, group settings, what that's going to look like. But there's definitely um, a desire by those providers, skills being a large one, that they do want to look at reopening. Um, you know, a lot of the mental health services, um, you know, psych rehab, all of those group kind of settings are still receiving guidance from the state, um, but we're hopeful that they'll get back to some percentage of a capacity. It's kind of why we went with 75%, because we knew that, you know, some people will not want to come back full time to some of our programming. Um, you, you know, we, we recognize that telehealth for the time being is an allowable service under some of those medical appointments. Um, and as long as that's allowed, we'll see some reduction because of telehealth. Um, and so I think that's kind of why we went with that 75% because we, the landscape of some of what transportation provided changed. Uh, and we just don't have a time frame yet of if it'll change back or if it continues, you know, what we'll see. So, um, you know, we talked a lot about you know, what the internal staff needed transportation, and Dave mentioned that they do not have a current need for that office position. Um, and then they have been tracking regularly the, the hours of the staff. So um, we know it's a loss. Um, I am surprised, just to say this, is that I am surprised MATP has not kind of come out to say that they would do bridge funding. We received that, Ryan and I have talked about this, we received it within uh, case management and some of our mental health services, the community care, agreed to do bridge payments, um, knowing the loss of revenue would impact county. So I'm just, I'm surprised they haven't agreed to it publicly yet um, because it just makes sense because uh, the funding's already been allocated. There really is nowhere that money goes back to, so to speak. Um, so we're hopeful they would do it, but the worst case scenario is what uh, Brian and Dave, you know, gave to Tom and, and Margaret, so. And I would like to add the the three hundred grand that's proposed to be transferred over. Um, if we get into twenty, you know, throughout the end of this year, and certain things come through, and um, we could transfer some of those funds back, if you know, or a majority of them back. So there's nothing once it gets transferred transferred over from general fund of transportation, saying that it can't be transferred back. So we can we have that availability and capability of doing that too. Okay. On the MA side, if I can just add, uh, you know, we, we the most recent conversation that we had with the medical assistance people, uh, we had a uh, discussion about a week and a half ago, and uh, it, it was a question and answer thing about situations where we're at. And, and as in most of my dealings with MA in the 10 years as director here, you ask questions, but you don't often get answers right away. So. Uh, you know, we all ask a lot of the same questions and uh, we're, we're basically told that they would get back to us. So, you know, we're waiting for that. Uh, but they're also back into the uh, study of how brokerage would be because that was a requirement whenever they delayed brokerage uh, several months ago that they have to do this study. So that seemed to be their focus that day more than anything. Uh, of course, talking to my colleagues throughout the, the center area here, we all felt disappointed that they weren't more focused on helping us through the pandemic. But they all they know what we need. They know where we're at. Uh, they also know that we're out there serving the way they want us to. So, you know, hopefully, like Natalie said, they will bridge us some and, and help us. Uh, that money's already been allocated and sent. So. You know, we're all hopeful that we can keep it and, and at least keep a portion of it uh, beyond to help us with some of our loss. Thank you.
Okay. Um, and anything else or any other uh, questions, Margaret, or that, that was really the summation? I think that um, gives you some context and uh, explanation of what's happening. There are unknowns here, so we, we have to take our best estimate at this point in time. Uh, as others have said, it is an estimate. Okay. Um, uh, so, Dave, we we were, we were sent a spreadsheet that has uh, your paratransit and your uh, business fleets. Do you have that PDF by chance? Was that something that was that something that was sent out to Dave? Tom or I I sent it to. This is Margaret. I sent it to the. Board of Commissioners at Tom's request. I thought Dave had it and now we had it already, but I can send it right now. I'll yeah, that, yeah, just just so that we're talking about the same thing would, would be helpful. I so yeah. I'm sending it right I ask, now. Is it this? Is it can I show you guys see if it's the same of what we have? Let me um, see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was what Ryan sent to me. Um Okay, or, or, okay, or Ryan, okay. Is that it? Yeah, yep. that's it. Yep. Okay. So on uh, page two, Natalie, it would be the. Uh, um, uh, let me see. Uh, on my sheet, it's on page two. Yeah, it's going to be the uh, uh, budget or the uh, expenditures for salary and wages. Yep. So, so we're only seeing. Why aren't we seeing a larger amount of savings there? For salaries, shouldn't that be a little bit larger with the furloughs we have? Looking to Ryan, but let me just come oh, back yeah. up. Yeah. So I understand we, we we said for all the furloughs and part time reduction of hours we're still paying the health care so the health care makes sense um, that that's that's there retirement that makes sense um, well the retirement maybe maybe not um, but yeah so I mean so are the sal why are the salaries similar. Ryan, can you speak to that? That's your. Yeah, that's what we yeah. did. Yeah, I mean the, the the figure. I I honestly do not know um, uh, at this moment in time that the figures are um, are actuals, in, which include um, you know which include the, uh, the the month to month difference that we plugged in for um, you know the payroll that wrapped May to May to June. But I have to I'd have to look into that. And see uh, to give you a, a, an accurate answer. Okay, so that yeah, that's just one thing that popped out at me is the fact that that's not. I think we should have more of a savings there. I would hope, Tom, from your spreadsheets that you've sent out to us, how much was the transportation, um, the savings for those those individuals? Um. Already so far, um, up until this, up until um, pay through pay 13, we would have seen a savings of about um, almost just uh, 22, almost 23 grand. Okay. Okay. And that's, is that, is that just salaries or is that also um, retirement, anything else? Well, that would be the salaries and then the, the FICA component of the Social Security that you wouldn't be paying out, uh, that you typically would be paying out. Okay. So that's typically just that and then that piece of it. Um, I'm trying to look and see to why we're have you know, with the numbers that were sent out there on a spreadsheet to see if I can see, see what it is. But to your point, um, there would be a substantial savings there with those four drivers out if we kept them out through the remainder of the year. Um, because again, you're you would be saving those salaries uh, for the 
the whole year times four um, salary, four positions plus the other office position. Well, no, my, I, I appreciate that. But my point is that we haven't yet seen those savings through the end of June. I, I, so I'm just curious why we're not seeing those savings yet um, in those positions. Well, there's something that's not reconciled properly because on Tom's sheet, it comes to $22,838 in total salary and benefit savings, right? Correct. And, and when you look at the same line here, we're seeing how much of a savings, um, I can't see it, uh, $6,000 savings. So we're missing, well, no, uh, 6,000 and uh, maybe 8,100. Uh, some a few benefits so there is a definite disconnect between what we calculated on our furlough sheet and what's showing up on this are, are we looking at this for the same so this is from January 1 through the end of May yes all right so we need to back out the June numbers here so when you back out the June numbers on Tom's sheet um, you know that we're getting closer, so maybe, maybe there's not as much of a disconnect. Okay, all right, that that could, that could be the case. So we're looking uh, at, so, at, just let me just say this too, the positions that we are looking at being furloughed in transportation um, are salaries of 33,000, 24,000, 17,000, 27,000, and 34, so they're not um, high, uh, compensated positions, highly compensated positions. So that may also be part of this. Uh, yeah, if you look okay, at it so through it, it, May, it's about, yeah, about 14 grand, about 14 grand through May, if you look at the furlough list, about 14,000. Um, okay, uh, so, so uh, uh, one of the concerns I have is that we're not, reducing expenditures as much as we need to be if we're if we're losing and our revenues are going through the floor um from my perspective we shouldn't wait we shouldn't um we shouldn't factor in the state giving us anything we already know that we're going to be at a loss for the year so if the state does give us anything that's great um but we should be doing everything we can be doing to reduce expenditures as much as we as, as we can uh i do know that we do have three weeks left of the federal pandemic on insurance uh, but we have to we have to get serious about um, recommend or looking at if we're going to be having conversations about long term um, not necessarily furloughs uh, but uh, potential terminations um, just because we, we do not we don't have the ridership um, I think 75 percent is a high number I I, I with the uncertainty that we have, we 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 may want to have a 75% projection, but I think a more realistic project, projection is 50%. Um, we're just getting back to 50% now, and there's a potential that we could see a reduction in in travel in the future if we have uh, cases increase. And we have no idea what's going to happen with the Penn State students when they get back and how that's going to affect everything here. So I, I'd like to see a 50% ridership. Uh, uh, budget to see what that looks like and um, I, I would suggest that also on the ID and senior centers reopening um, if they choose if the if ID and service providers do on that front that's fine but um, uh, in, you know that that's their decision and based upon state guidance for the senior centers um, I mean, this is another conversation to have, but I think we need to have a conversation about whether or not we want to reopen them. Um, I, I'd want to know what type of options we have, where if we need if we need to reopen, or if we have the opportunity not to do that. Um, I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. I didn't know that July 13th they were going to be reopening, so I want to have a little bit more discussion on that front. Um, uh, but um, also, Dave, one thing that I, I would like to get whenever you have a chance is the percentage of vehicle or the, what percentage of vehicles are full uh, in terms of how much downtime people are having. You know, because if people are if people are going out for to pick pick up one person and transporting that one person into state college, and they used to be doing you know a van full, um, 
I, I'd want to know how efficient the vehicles are at. Uh, so if we could please work on that. Also, uh, if we may need to reduce hours of service, um, we, we may need to look at that just because this is really going to be a significant amount of revenue that we're going to be, or a significant amount of general fund dollars that we're looking to contribute to this. And the fact that I applaud everybody for get, for taking the time midway through the year to look at this, but we need to have really, I think we need to have more conservative estimates about where we're going to be at and understanding how much we're going to be needing to put into this. Now that all fluctuates if the state comes back and says we're able to soften the blow a little bit, that's fine and we can we can uh, go from there. But my thoughts are that we have to get uh, you know more conservative on the numbers. We need to look at recommendations when it comes to limiting positions, uh, sadly, but we need to we need to look at that. And then also we need to understand how efficient these vehicles are and if we need to reduce uh, service levels potentially beyond um, eliminating positions. Um, it's it's something that we should at least be looking at and taking an eye on. Uh, but at this time, I, I uh, unless, unless those things are able to be fulfilled, I, I wouldn't be in the position at this point to uh, authorize any any general fund dollars going into the transportation fund at this point. Um, so that that's that's my perspective on it. I, I again want to recognize that we do need to make this decision in a timely manner, but I'm at this point, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that until we have some more conservative numbers for the rest of the year. But Commissioner Higgins, if you wanted to weigh in at this time. And like uh, overall, a, a good summary. Um, I know Dave works hard. I know his people are working hard. <clears throat> the uh, budget on the fleet side, you know, is a smaller budget and the losses there are relatively small. But on the uh, <clears throat> paratransit side, um, besides the fact that we um, are probably running less efficiently with fewer people um, on the buses, uh, I'm seeing a reduction in fuel costs of, uh, I think it was 44 to 46 percent, which means we're probably taking that fewer number of trips. Uh, and I, I think that kind of supports that a 75 percent revenue is, is probably pretty optimistic. And we probably do need to look at something more like a 50 percent revenue on the paratransit side. And obviously, from an efficiency standpoint, that really hurts uh, because we're not going to be running buses at anything close to full. Um, yeah, I'd also <clears throat> like to have a conversation soon, uh, hopefully in, including Commissioner Dersham, about the uh, senior centers reopening. But even if they do, my assumption would be social distancing will be in place. And um, as unfortunately a lot of our small business people are seeing, just because you reopen doesn't mean people show up. Um, so I suspect that even if those senior centers reopen, it's going to be to a fraction, a small fraction initially of the uh, the normal number of clients. So I don't I don't see trips moving up all that much. Um, you know, unfortunately we do have a, a certain amount of fixed cost in that uh, department that we can't adjust. Um, and also, obviously, most of the staff that might not have duties are going to tend to be our lower paid staff. But, you know, we can't we can't have a single department, um, one that's supposed to be coming close to breaking even or breaking even in a good year, uh, losing Five hundred and ninety-six thousand dollars, based on optimistic projections for the second half of the year. It, it just can't happen. So, out of curiosity, in terms of when when some of these models were run or some of these projections were run, um, because it'd be helpful. I mean, if, if we were running mo when we did the shutdown and, and we're in red, um, if we started looking at things and said we we thought cases were going to pick or we we're going to think travel was going to pick up, was there was there any estimating at that point 
Dave in terms of when things would be picking back up, what that would be looking like. Um, you know, did you have any, are, are, basically are we meeting, are we meeting the estimates that you were thinking about? Are we not? Was there, was there any thought given to that? Well, obviously until we went into yellow and, and the green phase, you know, we didn't have a lot of uh, data to work with other than the, the uh, trips that were being run out of uh, sheer necessity for the people that had to go. Uh, so a, a, as things opened up, the doctor's offices started seeing people, they started doing procedures. And, and of course, that means that everything is, is starting to trickle back. So, you know, we, we look at that data every week and, and compare it week to week uh, and, and follow the uh, trends and, and what's happening. Uh, I don't know how else we can do it. Uh, I think that the projections we put forth were, uh, I, I feel they were pretty uh, uh, cautiously optimistic, uh, yes. But, uh, you know, and it depends on certain things happening. If the senior centers do not reopen, then we have to factor that in and, and probably put us back down in that 50% range. Uh, and. If things continue to trend well, uh, I would hope to think we're going to exceed our projections. But there again, it, it all depends on how things happen over the next several weeks here in central Pennsylvania and, and what the demand is. If we go backwards, uh, you know, the, we obviously are never going to uh, get to where we think we should be. Uh, Ryan and my staff people here have been working on these numbers and trying to be, you know, cautious in, in the optimism of projection. Uh, I don't know, Ryan, can you interject any more thought there for me? Yeah, sure. So, um, so obviously April was our, was our floor. Um, from May to, to April, we're up 30% from June. To May, we were up 68%. So May to June, we're up 917 trips, um, which puts us about six, 680 trips from that 50%. And that's again with with C with basically no activity to CSG, as Natalie mentioned, with uh, psych rehab, which again we still expect to be low, but uh, uh, that's a you know a, a component. That's with no senior centers and no skills, which is, you know, again, those are some pretty big pieces. Um, so even if just skills reopens on July 13th, uh, you know, I certainly think we would we would easily eclipse that 50 percent. Again, assuming no uh, pullbacks uh, with the Penn State University situation, as, as you mentioned, um, uh, Commissioner Pipe. But we're we're actually increasing quicker than we thought we did. We would at this point. Uh, June numbers were much higher than we thought. Yeah. They would be. And when okay, that that is helpful. And oh, when the, yep. and when, no, go ahead. You know, uh, the counties when they went green Memorial Day weekend or probably thereafter, or I guess the week after, it took some of the state programs time to give guidance out because I don't think that a lot of that was kind of given to them about what it was going to look like when some counties went green and some stayed in yellow and red. So it's taken some of our state programming offices time to give that recommendation back to the counties about what we should be doing, how we should be reopening. So June was being given the time to a lot of those state offices to give us the guidance about what we should be doing. So that's why I think you're hearing more about July being opening dates because it took the state programs time to respond to not just saying green means you can resume as normal. It took plan, it's taking, I mean, you know, I can tell you that senior centers, the guidance is we have to take the square footage of programming and divide it by a certain number to determine the number of participants that are allowed to be on site. So, I mean, that's the kind of guidance that we're getting from the state, not just, hey, you can reopen and resume your typical activities. It's not even that. Um, and so I just think June has taken us some time to to get that guidance um, before we can kind of see what July will bring us. But knowing that June returned to a higher rate with just medical appointments, 
you know, appointments that seniors have, have been wanting to do, things like that, you know, allowed us to look at our numbers that way, I guess. But we can look at a, at a more significant 50% projection. Thank you. That, I think that would be helpful. Um, okay. And uh, uh, <laughs> to kind of summarize, if I if I heard properly, I think I heard that for the second half of the year, there's a forecast of losing a third of a million dollars on top of the quarter mill we've already lost. Yeah, that, that's just not acceptable. I know people are working hard. I know people are trying to be as efficient as possible, but we have a department supposed to be breaking even. And to, to forecast an additional loss of a third of a million based on optimistic projections, uh, I, I mean, that's like a half of a good year of surplus for the whole rest of the other 49 departments put together. Yeah, I think I think the, the 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 mentality would be we've already lost some in the first half of the year. We know that's a loss in terms of the re from the revenue side and expenditure side. Get that, um, but um, in the back half, if we can make it up, I'd rather project conservative and we come come in higher on the second half rather than projecting higher and coming in lower there. It just and that's just a philosophically. Uh, but Dave, in terms of that efficiency for the vehicles, um, I think that would be really helpful. Um, how how do you think you could go about doing that? What would that look like? Well, right now we're, we're transporting multiple people and vehicles, but obviously instead of putting two seat, two people in a uh, double seat, we're putting one. So so if it's a 12 passenger vehicle, we're trying to keep it at six people or, or no more than six. Uh, you know, that that's the approach we've taken to, to try to maintain some distancing for people. Obviously they're all wearing masks and, and, and doing that part. You know, our drivers are cleaning on a regular basis. We're, we're disinfecting the entire vehicle uh, every week totally. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't I, I don't think we want to go more than uh, one person per seat uh, right now, uh, or, or we're going against all the guidelines that are set forth. So you know we're we're obviously trying to do that. Uh, you know we're we're trying to meet the demands uh, of of the clientele and, and keep them safe and and feeling safe uh, while they're riding. But we're certainly open to any suggestions or directives uh, on what we should do for sure. I, mean, I know Dave and his staff are really up against it here because even at a 75% um, capacity, it's, it's just hard to be efficient to start with. And then as Dave mentions, um, for health reasons, we probably don't wanna run vehicles at 90% at full. Um, are we ever doing pickups where we're picking up, say, at least two people from the same household or from the same group home or something like that? Absolutely, yes. We do that uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, we have multiple people from the same neighborhood uh, and, and we drive one, you know, two doors up and pick up the second or the third or mm -hmm. the fourth person, most definitely. All right, so I was wondering if the software was sophisticated enough to say, I don't think the neighborhood thing would work because obviously if they're three houses down from each other, they're, they're not exposing each other. But if we're picking up two people from the same group home or perhaps um, two people from the same household because a, a relative is, is, is going with the actual patient, can we seat them next to each other? Yeah, that, that's certainly not an issue. I mean, we can cert, uh, husband, wife, absolutely, you know, right. or a, a mother, a child, absolutely. And, and I, I'm sure that they do seat together, but you know, when, when they don't live together and live in the same household, we wanna try to give them the independence uh, and, and the safety feeling. But, you know, my motto is fill the vans, but obviously in this day and age, we can't do that. But Right. If we can fill them at 50% capacity, that's better than 25% capacity. 
Certainly. And, and the other thing, well, also, you know, I have drivers that work sometimes just four hours in a day, depending upon the number of trips. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not running the vans just to run them. If they don't have trips, they're done. They, they finish their day out and they're done for the day. So, you know, in that respect, we're not, uh, you know, we're not just out there waiting for a call. I mean, we, we, we move those trips from driver to driver. And when we have one that has nothing to do for a period of time, we, we clear that person's day and send them home for the day, get the van off the road. So, you know, uh, I think in that respect, we're, we're, we're not, yeah, we're, we're, we're really trying to be mindful of uh, how many hours we're in those vans and driving them around, uh, you know, to, to cut down on the cost as very best we can. You know, an example is my Penns Valley run. That van brings usually seven people in every morning and, and takes home seven people every day. So, you know, uh, that's still a, a fairly effective run uh, as long as those facilities are functional. So when skills reopens, that, that only enhances. And, and they, too, are on the timeline that the senior centers are, from what they're telling me, to reopen with a modified schedule. So I, I don't know. I, I it, it is all a guess. Uh, it, it's like everything else we're dealing with. We're, we're speculating what we think should happen and will happen, but uh, only time's going to tell us what's really going to happen, I think. I think what we would ask to do is, is to, to look at that 50%. We would probably ask to pull in Kristen from HR because I do think we're going to have to look at, if you're talking some significant personnel changes, we're going to have to look at job descriptions. We're going to have to look at, you know, what we have as full-time, part-time, on-call to have to make some decisions, and that's going to require HR. So um, we would ask that we pull Kristen or whomever she chooses into this for us to determine if there are job changes, if there's, you know, going people from full time to everybody and on call, what that looks like. I don't mean that's a suggestion. I just mean that's the kind of scenarios that to get us to the 50 percent, it's going to require us to have to have a, a quick converse, not a quick, but quickly pulled together conversation with HR. Just to make sure that we cover ourselves for the benefit of all of you. I mean, we need to make sure we do that before we give you recommendations that affect personnel stuff. If I could just add on. Yeah. Uh, so I, I almost think that there are two discussions here that are running simultaneously. They interrelate, but they're two different discussions in a way because one of the decision points, and Tom, you can correct me, is about how to end 2019 so we can get the CAFR closed. Um, and then the second part of this is all the prospective expenditures and estimates. And yes, we need to redo these numbers and um, go through the process that Natalie is describing. But um, if we wait until we have all of that prospective um, cost forecasting in place, we will miss the deadline for closing out 19. So, uh, Tom, am I am I understanding that correctly, or do you want to speak to that? Because we know what what where we ended in 19, and that's a question about how much of it do you want to? It's where do you want to show the money? You know, where, do you want it to show a, a lesser uh, uh, number in in transportation, or let it hang out there and then have a higher uh, you know, reserve balance at the end of the calendar year. So I think there are two things going on here. Yeah, and that's exactly where I was going to um, interject and talk about that. And you, you said exactly what I was thinking. Again, there's two different areas that we're looking at. You know, a piece of this was just more for positioning purposes with moving those funds over. And it's fine. I mean, we don't have to move those funds over as of the end of 19. We just have an opportunity to do that because we had a surplus and we could position funds over. We simply could say, we're not gonna move those funds over. We leave them, we leave it in the unassigned general fund balance, and then you can make that decision in 20, and then move it over at any point in 20 if, if you want to. Again, 
it was more philosophical and, and positioning based on where we, you know, we were fortunate enough to land with the surplus as for the county as a whole. And we were in that situation where we could move that over. But again, like you said, we're kind of, um, we have a time frame there to be able to get those, that information to um, the controller's office and our auditors, because again, we're going to have to submit that cap or once those numbers are final for 19, they're done. Um, and then again, the second piece of this is, you know, having this discussion now so that we can make these adjustments and not get to the situation where we were in the fall or uh, winter and then looking back on it, trying to get ahead of this and uh, realizing that what we went through in April and May was what it was, but now trying to react even more aggressively to that. So again, you're right, it's two different conversations and we can handle it either way. I mean, we don't move the money over, that's fine. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly, Margaret, about the retrospective, prospective, a little bit of deja vu from the uh, 10 a.m. meeting we had. But um, on the retrospective issue, I, I, at this point, I'm not in favor of moving the, the funds over. I appreciate the recommendation and the rationale behind it and the, the uh, uh, why we could do it. I just i am not comfortable doing it at this point. Um, and uh, so that's, that's my take. But again, Commissioner Higgins, if he has a different perspective on it, and Commissioner Dersham as well, that's fine. But Mark, if you wanted to weigh in. Um. Well, on the retrospective portion, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to transferring the money into the 2019 budget. Um, because especially for the first few months of the pandemic, that was just very difficult to anticipate, uh, very difficult to react to. Um, you know, and again, depending on Commissioner Durson's view, but I, I don't know, I would lean toward the retrospective movement of, you know, two or 300K to the transportation budget. Um, I mean, Dave and his staff are in a really hard spot, <clears throat> spot right now because they have fairly high fixed and overhead costs. And yet, under our most optimistic scenario of 75% plus occupancy <clears throat> and the state, sending us that extra 120,000 of revenue, which is not assured at this point. But if it, if it happened, we're still looking at almost a $200,000 loss under pretty optimistic scenario. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do think that we've got to look at more of a 50% um, or a little better than 50% trip scenario and assume that since the state of Pennsylvania is falling off a fiscal cliff, on December 1st, that any additional funds we receive that aren't currently in the budget are probably not going to be 120,000 bucks. That is a great point. I never thought about it that way. Uh, where, um, the, unless they're eating, well, my understanding is that CARES Act money cannot be used to replace revenue, Correct. and um, for, for governments, for governments, yes. it can't be. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, so we can reschedule it or we can have this conversation on next. Uh, Tom, when is the final date on this? Well, I think Jason had sent out some information that they're trying to get a draft cap or maybe out to um, the finance committee here within the next week or so. And that there will be an opportunity uh, maybe, you know, to the middle of July until they get back um, any comments from the finance committee and then they're going to have to finalize that and submit it down to um, the DCED and then the GFOA that the, the extension date is through the end of July. But again, they're going to have to cut it at some point. So I would think that, you know, by the, um, you know, somewhere between the 15th or the 20th, they're going to have to have a final number so that they can, you know, finalize that draft and then get the numbers down there. And again, we can do it either way. Um, if we don't make the adjustment now, but those funds would just flow through to the unassigned fund balance. You would show a surplus. Then we would just go into 20. And if, if we would have to make them whole, we would just move the money over at a later date. So, so why don't we put it on the agenda for the ninth, a week from today uh, on the 10 a.m. meeting and Commissioner Dersham can weigh in, break the tie and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. Um, then on the prospective portion, um, uh, I mean, if there, Dave, if there's a, if you could next week develop some sort of way to 
again, let us let us know vehicle by vehicle how full they are throughout the day. It'd be very helpful for me because I, so unfortunately for you, Dave, having a big heart and and we love you for that. Your department is probably the the wor one of the worst ones to be situated during a pandemic. Your your business model, for lack of a better phrase, is built on senior citizens and driving them around the county in a packed vehicle. That's your business model. Unfortunately, during this pandemic, as we all know, that is very highly dangerous. So um, to put people in that situation. So as an effect, there's going to have to be significant, uh, from my standpoint at this point, just because we've gone through the first half of the year where we had during, uh, at least we had January and February were very good months, um, but we, we, we don't know what the future is going to look like. And so from my standpoint, you know, we're going to have to start looking at conversations. And I think Commissioner Higgins uh, said similar things. We're going to have to look at conversations about uh, what our reduction is going to look like. And I appreciate the part time where you, you might be reducing hours if they're not busy at the end of the day. But a large portion of that is the health care costs. And we just have to be mindful of that and realistic about that and, and you know, have those conversations. No, nobody wants to be in this position, uh, but we, we, we need to have those kind of conversations. So one thing that's going to be helpful to me as we go forward with making those decisions is a data point that essentially shows us during this period where we're fluctuating, you know, close to 50 percent, maybe jumping above it, how full of these vehicles. And if there is an argument to be made that we do need to keep more people on than, um, you know, if we've got 10 vehicles that are each 80% full, it may not make sense for us to cut two drivers, even though that would be, that would work in terms of an efficiency standpoint, but if we can't because of social distancing and other things like that, that would factor into it as well in the, in the geography of the county. So I just don't want to look purely at numbers. I want to actually look at the vehicle and understand uh, how full they are and where they're coming from. And again, um, just so that we can still remain, because we may need to not cut people because we need to from a social distancing standpoint. Um, so that would be helpful from, from my standpoint. So if you could do that next week, uh, that, that would be appreciated. Um, and if you need any, any, anything from us in order to understand what, what we're looking for on that, um, you know, feel free to ask. I mean, you know, from the transportation department standpoint, pretty much no matter what they do, um, we're going to, to have a loss for the second half of the year. We're just going to between the, the safety, the fluctuations, uh, the lowered efficiency, um, the fact that I, I'm just not very certain that the state's going to give us any more money than they absolutely have to. Um, but let's just try to keep that loss um, as, as, as low as we can. Well, I, I'm not anticipating the state giving us anything more than what they allocate, other than uh, they have a, a emergency funding for certain situations. That's the only thing we're looking at potentially getting something from. Uh, it's not them allocating additional funds to offset our losses by no means. Uh, and, and, you know, the data that, that you're looking for, we can certainly compile that. I, I guess my question is this. Uh, you know, we service the entire county, so when I get a call from someone that lives in Blanchard that needs to go to the doctor, uh, at, you know, am I going to restrict that service to these people going forward? Because I might be riding for uh, 15 or 20 minutes with one person on the van until I get into Belfont and maybe grab a couple more. So that, that makes it difficult in the fact that we do serve the entire county. And we do a lot of uh, trips that, you know, are, are sort of single trips for a, a portion of the ride, you know, to to meet the needs of the, the people that we're serving. So, you know, if we're going to, if we need to rethink our, our operational hours and, and the level of service, you know, we, we, we certainly can do that uh, to to cut back on those type of trips. Uh, that that's a whole another conversation that if we're going to do that for shared ride lottery trips, we have to run that through the state and let them know that, uh, you know, and the fact that if we're going to restrict trips or have any, put any restrictions in place, that's the only thing that we have to do to, to make them aware of that. 
So that's helpful as well. So there may be guardrails where we can't say, instead of it being where you need to schedule 24 hours in advance, we have to get a call 48 hours in advance. If there are guardrails that we can't because it's a state mandate about what, how we can provide services and when we, the time, timeliness of it, that's all good to, to, for us to know. Um, and again, I, I, I don't think we're talking at, at all about saying to somebody, we're not going to give you a ride. Um, I think it's more about understanding that they may need to wait a little bit longer to be able to schedule a ride. Uh, but again, that goes back to the state mandates. Um, but uh, so again, those kind of situations are important, Dave, for us to consider and think about. But it might be where we, we have to slot that person in next week, um, you know, or you know, find a different way to do it. Um, so that's my thought on it. I realize you operate under a long list of rules. Um, but yes, if there are things we can do, like possibly Commissioner Pipe's um, proposal of maybe a 48 hour notice instead of a 24 hour notice, um, yeah, would that make things any more efficient? Uh, would that drastically decrease service to the citizens? Is it allowable under state law? Um, but we, we, we just can't lose $596,000 from a single department that has, um, you know, maybe $2 million or so of uh, revenue or less in a good year. We certainly understand that. And, and look, at the end of the day, we have to live with the decision that we make. If it is reduction of staffing, if it's if it's pulling back on services, but um, we're we're living in a time where, or it, we're living in circumstances right now with the pandemic, where uh, I would I, I uh, welcome those type of, of thoughts and suggestions about how we can be more mindful about how we're uh, spending money and allocating resources at this point. So even if it is a a more um, harsh or difficult uh, presentation in terms of, you know, we could, you know, re again, re you know, reduce this or reduce that. I, we're all going to be celebrating when this is over, uh, however long that takes, and uh, that we can give rides to everybody um, in a timely manner and vans are full, but, but right now it's not the case. So suggestions are welcome related to how we can reduce expend expenditures at this point. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so again, we'll talk about this next Tuesday, next Thursday, for the uh, funding for the cat for the uh, for 2019. Um, and next week, Dave, if you if you have information that you can provide to us, um, even you know when, whenever you're ready, we, uh, it would be good to talk about this again when you when you can. Okay. Gather data. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any Anything else we needed to discuss on this, Margaret, or is that essentially it? Uh, I think that's it. The purpose, this was a single focused uh, work session on transportation. So I think that's okay. it. Okay. Uh, hearing nothing else from the board, would there be a motion to adjourn the work session at 210? Motion to adjourn the work session at 210. I'll second that. Any further discussion on adjournment? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried.